Well, please open your Bibles at John's Gospel in chapter 1 again. We are in week 3 of our series, Meet Jesus. We began in John chapter 1 and verse 18, where we saw no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. We saw that Jesus Christ is the eternal, personal, divine, creating, life-giving, incarnate Son of God, the sevenfold glory of Jesus Christ. He is with God. He is God. He is come from the Father, and for this reason, uniquely, He is able to make the Father known. So, the question, how can I know God, and how can I find God, uh, the answer to these questions lies in Jesus Christ. That's what we saw at the beginning of our series. Uh, he who has seen me, Jesus says later in John's Gospel, has indeed seen the Father. And then we saw last week that when you meet Jesus, you not only come to know God, but you come to know something very profound about yourself. We looked at the question, who am I? And in particular, we saw how John the Baptist answered that question in two ways. The first was, he says very clearly, I am not the Christ. I'm clear about this. I am not the Savior. I am not able to fix myself, and I'm certainly not able to fix other people. The answer is, does not lie in me. In fact, I am not worthy to untie the sandals of the feet of Jesus Christ. And we saw this amazing gift that this Jesus Christ, the eternal incarnate Son of God, whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, should reach out to us in love and in mercy should embrace us in His redeeming love, and that He should call us His own. Now, our title today is Knowing Who Jesus Is. Actually, I think we've already seen who Jesus is in the sevenfold glory that's in these opening verses of John. I think a better title would have been Knowing What Jesus Does, but I want to focus in on two statements in the verses that were read uh, here today. And as I've reflected on this during this last week, um, it has come to me in a fresh way. I don't think there could be a clearer statement anywhere of what Jesus Christ does and what He is therefore able to do for any person and every person in the church here today. And the two statements are in verse 29 and then in verse 33, if you would look at them with me. Verse 29, "'Behold the Lamb of God,' John says." who takes away the sin of the world. Then verse 33, this is he who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So, here in these verses, you have the clearest possible statement of the two great works of Jesus Christ. Here is why the Son of God came into the world. What did He come to do? He comes to take away sin, John says, and He comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Here is the great work of Jesus Christ. Get it clear in your mind. What can you ask of Him to do? What is it that He does in the lives of people who believe in Him? He takes away sin, and He gives the Holy Spirit. That is what Christ does and what He is able to do for all who will come to Him today. So, let's focus in on these two things together, because you can't get a clearer statement of the very core of Christian faith itself. So, let's begin here. Christ takes away sin. Behold the Lamb of God, John says, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, remember the setting. John is out in the wilderness, as we saw last time. People are coming to Him in very, very large numbers indeed. His message has been, God is coming near, you're going to meet with God, and you better get yourself ready. And there was a resonance of that message in the lives and in the hearts of many people. People thought, I'm not ready to meet with God. If God's going to come near, there are some things that I need to confess. I need to find a way of being right with God. And so, they come to John, and there are large crowds, and they're confessing their sins, and they are being baptized by John in water. And we saw last week that a delegation of Pharisees came, and uh, John gave them this very clear testimony about himself and about Jesus. I'm not the Christ. In fact, I'm not worthy uh, to untie his sandal. 
And now verse 29, the very next day after the delegation had come from the Pharisees, Jesus comes walking near to where John was. Remember, Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, uh, was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and he was baptized by John, the other gospels tell us. And on this occasion, out there in the wilderness, Jesus comes near to this place where John is teaching and where he is baptizing. And John sees him, and he says, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when John said this, he was speaking to people who knew the Old Testament, and that is where we must look in order to find what this remarkable title means. Now, I want just to make three observations here on the Lamb of God. The first is that in the Old Testament, the Lamb is a substitute. And I'm thinking here of the story in Genesis in chapter 22, um, where we have this extraordinary occasion where God tested Abraham take your son, God said to Abraham, your only son who you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. And we're told about how Abraham goes to uh, the mountain with Isaac, and then as they get there, Isaac says to him, now, Dad, we've got the fire and we've got the wood, but where, where is the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? He uses that word that is to be sacrificed. And Abraham says, God will provide for himself a lamb. And you remember the story of how they go to the top of the mountain, and then Isaac's life is spared because God provides a ram that is caught in a thicket that takes the place of Isaac on the altar of God, and it becomes the substitute. It goes in his place, and the death sentence falls on the ram, and Isaac, therefore, for that reason, is able to live because of this substitution. The story, of course, uh, always uh, raises questions. I remember seeing a, a Woody Allen film in, in which a Jewish family are reciting the story and then uh, an older member of the family who clearly has questions about it all uh, comes out with the line, of course, the real question is, what kind of God would ask Abraham to do such a thing? And you see, there isn't an answer to that in the Old Testament, but there is an answer to that in the New, and here's what it is. You see, there we see that the sacrifice, the lamb that God provided was His only Son, who He loved. And the whole point of the ancient story, which always makes us squirm, is to give us some sense of what it actually meant for God Himself to speak not to spare His one and only Son, but to give Him up freely for us all. And for this Son, who is God and is with God, to give Himself freely in grace and in mercy, to give us some glimpse into who this God is, this story is given to us. Um, the lamb is a substitute. Second, the lamb is a sacrifice. I'm thinking here of the story in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, the story of the Passover. And you remember that story where um, the judgment of God was about to come through the land of Egypt. And God told His people to um, sacrifice a lamb and to paint the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and on the lintel of their houses. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So, the life of the lamb was given, and the blood of the lamb was shed. And John says in the New Testament, rolling the story forward, behold the lamb of God. What that means is, look, Jesus is the substitute who is going to stand in your place, and this Jesus is the sacrifice whose blood will be shed on your behalf. And the third thing you need to know about the Lamb is that the Lamb in the Old Testament was the sin-bearer. 
And here I'm thinking about the famous words in Isaiah in chapter 53. Isaiah makes it very clear that the lamb who was a substitute and a sacrifice was actually a person. He uses the word he repeatedly, that what happened with animals in the New Testament was actually pointing to, hap- to what would happen not only with a person, but the most glorious person this world has ever seen, the eternal and incarnate Son of God Himself. He will come among us as a servant. He will be despised and he will be rejected. The Lord will lay on him the iniquities of us all, and he will be led like a lamb to the slaughter. And when John says, therefore, behold the Lamb of God, all of that is being Uh, unpacked in Jesus Christ. He's the substitute, he's the sacrifice, he is the sin bearer. The Lord lays on him the iniquities of us all. Behold the Lamb of God. This is who Jesus is. This is why he has come into the world. Second observation here, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Notice that the word sin is singular here, not plural, the sin of the world. Dr. Harry Ironside, who was the pastor of Moody Church here in Chicago during the 1930s and also the 1940s, uh, writes in a way that I find profoundly helpful on this. Uh, Here's what he says, sins, plural, are only the effect of a cause. And the Lamb of God came not only to take away the individual's sins, but to deal with the sin question as a whole. He not only atoned for all our acts of sin, but He died for what we are as sinners by nature. Then says Dr. Ardenside, within this heart of mine, there are tendencies to sin that are worse than any act of sin I have ever committed. Isn't that a fascinating statement? I've done some things, but actually if you could see inside this heart, there are things that lie behind the things that actually are worse than the things that were done. That's what he's saying. And of course, this is why Jesus speaks to what's in the heart time and time again. He says, this is true for all of us. We are sinners by nature. Sin dwells in us, and Christ died to put away sin not merely sins by the sacrifice of Himself. God took all this into account when Jesus Christ hung on the cross. That will be liberating, I hope and pray, for someone today. Because what it means is this, that sin as a barrier that keeps you away from from God has been dealt with in total in all of its aspects by Jesus Christ. That includes the sin that goes on in the mind, the pullings in unworthy directions in the heart, in the desires, and in the imagination, as much as it deals with the sins, plural, in words and in deeds. He has dealt with this. He has dealt with everything that would keep you at a distance from God. That's what the Lamb of God has done. Notice third, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Some of you will know the marvelous drama that was acted out on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, uh, especially uh, that is recorded in Leviticus in chapter 16. And what happened on that day was a very powerful presentation of what is wonderfully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They brought a live goat to the high priest. And try and imagine this, the job of the high priest was to lay his hands on the goat's head and confess aloud all the sins of the people of Israel. That's going to be a long prayer. I'm so glad that pastors don't have to do this kind of thing with animals uh, in, in, in public. Can you imagine this? Trying to hold this thing down. 
confess all the pride and greed and everything that's gone on among the people of God that year. And then when this confession has been poured out, this is what Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 22 says, that the high priest puts the sins of the people on the head of the goat. This is what the holding of the head's all about. It's symbolizing a transfer that's taking place. And then you know what happened with that live goat? A man took that goat and led it out into the wilderness where it was never, never, never seen again. Taken away. Now, you try and get hold of that picture because that's what John is saying Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, does for us, His people. He takes away sin. He gets it out of here. He gets it out of your side. He gets it uh, away from you. He separates it from you. He takes it to another place. Notice the present tense here. The great work of Christ bearing sin as our substitute, our sin bearer, and our sacrifice was done, of course, once for all at the cross. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and He lives to take away the sins of His people. It's what He's always doing. Matthew Henry says, Christ is always taking away sin. And He does it by the continual intercession of His blood in heaven and by the continuing, continual influence of His grace on earth. So, as we take in who Jesus Christ is and what He does in this regard, what am I to do then when I become aware of sin in my life? You become aware of sin in your life, what are you going to do? You've got to give it to Him because He is the one who takes sin away. And that's why it's such a marvelous thing that this is in the present tense, because no matter how long we live as Christians and how much we may grow in the Christian life, there will never be a time when we are beyond the need for Jesus Christ to be taking away the rubbish of our lives, the stains, the failings, the sins. I love how Jerry Bridges puts this. Your worst days, he says, are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Thank God that I have a Savior who lives to take away sins, and He is able to do it because of that once for all achievement on the cross that He ever lives to apply to my life and to apply to the lives of all who look to Him. Fourthly, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The world. It's fascinating. As you follow the pattern or the theme in the Bible of the Lamb as the substitute and as the sacrifice and as the sin bearer, you find that there is a widening stream as the revelation of God unfolds, so that in the story about Isaac that we looked at, the lamb is a substitute for one person. Isaac gets off the altar, and he lives. One person. You get to Exodus, and the lamb that is slain there on the night of the Passover is for one family. You get to the Day of Atonement, and this confession of sins, and the taking away of sins onto the scapegoat, and it is for a whole nation. But you get to John in chapter 1, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, this is for the whole world. You see the widening streams? Beautiful. From one individual to the whole world. Now, for whom is this good news? For whom is this good news? Jesus Christ is good news for people who want to get rid of their sin. He is. Christ takes away sin. 
Now, here's what that means, friend. If you are really set on holding on to your sin, Jesus Christ will not be good news to you. There was a time in Jonah's life where he was like that. God said, I want you to go here. Jonah says, I'm determined. I'm not. I'm going to go there. And you remember how God dealt with him in such an extraordinary way? And at the end of Jonah in chapter 2, he says this, those who cling to worthless idols will forfeit the grace that could be theirs. So, you see what he's saying? If you're determined to hold on to your sin, you'll never know the grace that could be yours through Jesus Christ. He came to take away sin. And what this means is that there is marvelous good news for every person in the church today who says, that's what I want. I want to be rid of it. I want to be clean before God. I want to be reconciled to God. I want this off my back. I want to be cleansed. I want to be in a position where there is no condemnation ahead for me. If that's your place tonight, I want to be rid of my sins, then the coming of Jesus Christ is very, very good news for you uh, indeed. Um, the Lamb of God died to take away the sin of the world. And here's how you should reason. If He came to do this for the sin of the world, he can certainly do it for my sin. Faith begins here. I believe that he came to take away the sin of the world. Therefore, it follows that I can trust him to take away my sin in particular. And here's the wonderful thing, brother, sister in Christ, as often as you become aware of sin in your own life, you have a wonderful Savior to whom you can come. You have a high priest to whom you can confess, and He can do for you what no one else in the world could do. Think about this. You could confess your sin to a trusted friend, to a pastor, to a priest, to a counselor, or to a small group. Any of these may be good things to do. Any of these could hear your confession. Not one of them could take your sin away. There's only one person can do that in all of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, the incarnate Son of God. He's the one who not only hears your confession, he can take your sin away. And therefore, you must come to him because he alone, the lamb, is the substitute, and he's the sacrifice, and he's the sin bearer, and therefore, he's able uniquely to do this for you. So, what Jesus Christ does, he takes away sin. He takes away sin. Second, he gives the Holy Spirit. Christ gives the Holy Spirit. Now, notice what it says in verse 33. This is He, the Lamb of God, this is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, the word baptize, let's just get the word so that we see the huge significance of what John is saying here. The word baptize means to dip, to immerse, to drench, to saturate. So, uh, put all of these together, we're speaking about an abundant supply when the word baptize is used. Second, he says, this is he who baptizes, that's dips, immerses, drenches, saturates with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God Himself, the third person of the Trinity. So, to be baptized with the Spirit means to be drenched, dipped, saturated, filled, soaked in the very life of God Himself. Think about what this would mean. If you were immersed in water, 
there would be a certain wetness about you. If you were to be bathed in light, there would be a certain brightness about you. If you were to be dropped into a tank of sewage, there would be a certain odor <laughs> about you. You see what I'm saying? Whatever you are immersed in imparts something of its own nature. Water imparts wetness. Sewage imparts bad smell. Light imparts brightness. Whatever you are immersed in, to some degree, will impart its own nature to you. And here, therefore, we are being told something wonderful that's full of hope for us with regards to the Christian life. Jesus Christ immerses His people in the Holy Spirit of God. If you were to be drenched in the Holy Spirit of God, there would be a certain holiness about you. There would be some marks of godliness that would begin to kind of wash off on you because of the presence of God's Holy Spirit Himself in your life. You would find that there were some new thoughts that were coming to you, that were thoughts that honored God, and new affections that were beginning to fill you, that caused you increasingly to love things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates. You would find your own desires beginning to change so that when you feel the pull of the flesh that would have taken you in a wrong direction before, there's something within you that says, no, that's not me. I must not go there. And you're aware why, that, that it's the Holy Spirit of God that's producing this new impulse within you. And notice again that what Jesus does here is described in the present tense, baptizes. So, this is not a one-time thing. It is an ongoing outpouring of His Spirit into the life of a Christian believer. And surely this is what the Lord Jesus was referring to Himself later in John's gospel, John 7, uh, where He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to Me and drink, because whoever believes in Me out of his heart will flow rivers of water. And then John says, He said this with regard to the Holy Spirit. So, as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, this life begins to flow within you as you look to Him. This is what John's saying. You, you look, the Lamb of God, you, you look to Him, and He's going to be taking away sin, and then He's going to be doing this other wonderful thing. He's going to be baptizing you in the Spirit. He's going to be effusing you, immersing you in, in the very life of God Himself. Now, do you see, when you put these two things together, how Jesus Christ fulfills the two greatest promises in all of the Old Testament. They're brought together in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will make you clean, say, taking away of sin. And then two verses later, I will put my spirit within you and I'll move you in the direction of all of my statutes and all of my laws. And here's Jesus, and He's coming into the desert right at the very beginning of His public ministry. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God. He's the one who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He's the one for whom all the world has been waiting and longing, and this is what He is able to do for you. And friends, you think about this marvelous promise here. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. For whom is this good news? And the answer surely is that this is very, very good news for people who hunger and thirst after God. It is not particularly good news for people who are satisfied with their religion. There were many like that in the day of Jesus. And there are many like that today. 
Folks who might say, you know, I was baptized as a baby. I go to a place of worship. I pray when I feel I need to. I sometimes give. I occasionally read the Bible. I go to a good church. That's all I need. What more do I want? But think about this. While there were people who would have said the same thing in their context in the day of Jesus, there were other people who felt very differently. And they were precisely the ones who were coming out to John. They were people who were saying, you know, despite the fact that we're circumcised and despite the fact that we read the Torah and despite the fact that we worship in the synagogue and uh, despite the fact that we keep all of the festivals, if God is going to come near to us, we have a profound sense that we've got to get ready. And there are some sins for us to confess. And there is repentance that we need. And we are drawn to what John is doing. He's baptizing people in water. We, we feel we need that because we just see that for all our religion, we actually need to be cleansed. That was what was in their hearts. And can you therefore see the power of this when right there in the desert, John says, when he sees Jesus, here's the Lamb of God, behold him. He's the one who's going to take away the sin of the world, and He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And let's draw to a close here today. I'm just sneaking into next week's passage, but I just want to end here. Do, do you notice that the next day, verse 35, uh, Jesus comes by again, and John says exactly the same thing again, behold the Lamb of God. And when John's disciples heard this, they left John and they followed Jesus. Well, of course they did. Of course they did. Why in the world would you stay with John? You know he's not the Christ. He said himself he's not worthy to untie the sandals of this Jesus who is coming. Now this Jesus has come, and he says he's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I can only baptize you with water. That's all I can do. I can just give an indication of what's in your heart that you desire to be cleansed. He can actually cleanse you, and, and he can he can give you the Holy Spirit to give you power in your pursuit of the life that God is calling you to live. He's the one who can do that. And John's disciples say, we are out of here. We're after him. Of course they said that. And here's how that relates to us. Don't settle, my friend, for the outward form of religion. Jesus Christ says to you today, I have come to do for you what no religion in the world and no other person in the world can ever do for you. I have come to take away your sin. I have come to drench you in the very life of God Himself, and to those who are humble and to those who are hungry, that is the greatest good news that could ever be said. So, I want to say to you today, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And the humble and the hungry will respond to that by saying, that is exactly what I need. That is exactly what I desire. I want today in a fresh way for my sins to be taken far away from me, and I see that it's Jesus Christ who does that. I want my life to be filled, drenched, saturated, not with some of the muck that's been filling me, but with the very Holy Spirit of God who will enable me to begin to move in a new direction. Therefore, I will not settle for the outward trappings of religion only. I will follow Him. I will look to Him. I will go after Him. I will believe in Him, and I will trust Him. And in Him, you will find life indeed. Let's pray together, shall we?
The rich he has sent away empty, but he has filled the hungry with good things. Lord Jesus Christ, all that you have is what I need. And all that you give is what I desire. All that you are is what I seek. Take away my sin today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit today, that I may find peace in your forgiveness for my past and strength by your Spirit for my future. For these things I ask in the Savior's name.